Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's installments of our Lunch Bites series. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the privilege of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship here at the United States Capitol Historical Society. We're so glad so many of you have uh, taken time out of your day to join us and participate in this really fascinating topic and great discussion. Uh, we're so fortunate to have uh, Howard Mortman here to join us today. But before we get to his presentation, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping matters about how we use this uh, platform, this Zoom webinar platform to engage with you, our audience. First, if you have any questions for Mr. Mortman during the course of today's presentation, you can put them into the Q&A section of the webinar platform. It looks like two little speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on which device you're using to join us today. If you have any troubleshooting issues, if you're having difficulty hearing or seeing what's going on, you can put that into the chat box. I'll be keeping an eye on that and trying to answer real time. So once again, any content questions from Mr. Mortman can go into that Q&A section. Now I have the great pleasure of introducing the President and CEO of the U.S. Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, to get us started. Jane? Thank you so much, Sam. Good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to have our, our friends back together with us for our webinar series. This is gonna be a jam-packed week and it has been a challenging, challenging uh, start to 2021. And so as we take a deep breath, one of the things that many people find comforting is to think about maybe it's time to just take a moment for prayer you don't think about that as something that Congress does, but in fact, um, Congress had, from the very inception, established a chaplain. And since we've had this country, Congress has opened with a prayer. And so we have today a very distinguished speaker. Uh, Howard Mortman is the Director of Communications for C-SPAN, which anyone who follows Washington knows is the you know, way that you visually get to see what goes on uh, in Washington, D.C. and in Congress. And Howard has made it his business to look at the role of prayer in Congress with a particular perspective of the engagement and the involvement in the Jewish community. Um, in rabbis in blessing Congress. And so he's going to talk about that. But we thought that it would be a moment to stop and consider on January 6th, when Congress gathered, it was a tense moment even before the insurrection. And so both the House and the Senate opened with prayer each by the official chaplain. The official chaplain of the House had been appointed uh, January 3rd. So she was in her third day as chaplain. Uh, chaplain Barry Black, uh, the Senate chaplain, had been has been chaplain since his election in 2003. But each of them took very seriously the opportunity to open with prayer. So we'll take a minute to hear, remember this is before the insurrection. These are the prayers before the session began. We'll start with uh, Chaplain Black in the Senate. Failing love. As our lawmakers prepare to formally certify the votes, passed by the Electoral College, be present with them. Guide our legislators with your wisdom and truth as they seek to meet the requirements of the United States Constitution. Lord, inspire them to seize this opportunity to demonstrate to the nation and world how the democratic process can be done properly and in an orderly manner. Help them to remember that history is a faithful stenographer and so are you. We pray 
in your sovereign name. Amen. <clears throat> and similarly, the house opened with a prayer. Interestingly, both chaplains are retired admirals from the Navy, where they served as Navy chaplains. Uh, Admiral Kibben. Would you pray with me? O oh God, our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of discord and trouble. Mountains crumble and waters rage, nations roar, and yet we need not be afraid, for even now you abide with us in these times of great discord, uncertainty, and unrest. We who have pledged to defend our constitution against all enemies, we pray your hedge of protection around this nation. Defend us from those adversaries, both foreign and domestic, outside these walls and perhaps within these chambers, who sow seeds of acrimony to divide colleagues and conspire to undermine trust in your divine authority over all things. The journey of this experiment in democracy is perilous and demanding, fraught with anger and discontent, but wise rulers still seek you. So help us God to find you in the midst of us. So help us God to see your gracious plan even in the events of these days. So help us God to serve you and this nation with godliness and dignity. We lay before you the gifts of our hopes, our dreams, our deliberations and our debates that you would be revealed and exalted among the people. We pray these things in the strength of your holy name. Amen. Amen. So you get a sense of the weight that the chaplains felt as they opened the session. The chaplains stayed with the Congress as they were put in their, in their safe space and there are many stories about the private prayers that were prayed during that time that they were in safe space. But when they reconvened, they decided that they should once again start with an opening prayer. And so again, we will hear Chaplain Black, who I believe was be introduced by the Vice President. Let us pray. Lord of our lives and sovereign of our beloved nation, we deplore the desecration of the United States Capitol building, the shedding of innocent blood, the loss of life, and the quagmire of dysfunction that threaten our democracy. These tragedies have reminded us that words matter and that the power of life and death is in the tongue. We have been warned that eternal vigilance continues to be freedom's price. Lord, you have helped us remember that we need to see in each other a common humanity that reflects your image. You have strengthened our resolve to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, domestic as well as foreign. Use us to bring healing and unity to our hurting and divided nation and world. Thank you for what you have blessed our lawmakers to accomplish in spite of threats to liberty. Bless and keep us. 
drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to do your will and guide our feet on the path of peace. And God bless America. We pray in your sovereign name. Amen. And so as you could see, um, the chamber gathered together in joint session, chose Chaplain Black to pray for the assembled body. And it was a couple days later when uh, Admiral Gibbon uh, was able to offer her first prayer in the days after the insurrection. And so we will hear the words of the house chaplain, Chaplain Gibbon. Would you pray with me? Merciful God, we enter these chambers with a sense both of uncertainty and of indignation. The events of last week, the destruction, the damage, and the deaths of our fellow Americans are deeply disturbing. The seeds of discontent were sown across our country and we have reached the whirlwind. Almighty God, speak into the storm. Allow your Holy Spirit to descend upon the chaos and minister to our hearts. Still our fears that we would remain firm in our resolve. Still our anger that we would yield ourselves to your gracious design for this nation. Lord, vindicate your intent for us to serve as representatives, not just of our Dutch district, but of your will. Your love, Lord, endures forever. We pray, do not abandon the work of your heart. And as the Spirit moves among us, inspire us again with your purpose. Stir in us anew the desire to serve you well and faithfully as we seek to serve this divided country. Call us to hear the words of your mouth and praise you with our lives this day and in the days to come. For we pray these things in the strength of your holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, Howard, you've got quite an introduction. Um, you've heard from two distinguished clerics, two Navy admirals, um, and you've set forth to tell the story of prayer in Congress uh, with the perspective, you know, I think people didn't, don't really, when they think about prayer in Congress, they don't necessarily know that uh, since before the Civil War, rabbis have been invited as guest chaplains. And the Congress has recognized that the Jewish faith is indeed part of the families of faith that we have in the United States of America. So it, the audience is now yours. Uh, and just for the audience to know, um, Howard's presentation is going to sort of walk us through the role of rabbis. We will, as we always do, take questions in the Q&A when he is finished. So if you have a question as it goes along, just put it in there and I'll come back on and we'll do questions and you'll get your opportunity to ask questions. I know this audience. We count on you to do that. So thank you very much, Howard. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you to everybody. Uh, a couple of really quick things. First of all, this is an incredible opportunity. Um, I've done this presentation uh, to Jewish groups. Uh, the book is obviously about rabbis, but this is my first non-Jewish group. And, and that's important uh, because this story is a universal story, even though it is a uh, focus on the rabbi aspect of this. Uh, as Jane, as you mentioned, the history of uh, of of um, prayer in Congress, as you said, goes back to the very beginning. Uh, for me, the rabbi element of it is just the entry point, but it's really a story um, for everyone. So it's a great opportunity. The second thing I want to mention is um, actually going right to the videos that showed the, um, uh, we're going to go into a little bit of the history in a, in a moment here, but when you look back, particularly at, um, at uh, Barry Black's prayer, uh, the one we saw the Senate chaplain who uh, gave his prayer in the House because that was where they were counting electoral votes. Most times uh, when the chaplain, the official or I guess chaplain gives a prayer, he or she has a lot of time to work on it, a lot of time to think about it, a lot of time to write it. 
uh, connected to history, you know, connected to scripture, make it spiritual and so on. When you think about it, that prayer happened, what, uh, I think at eight o'clock at night and the chamber and the Congress had just been cleared at the most two hours prior to that. Um, so he, you know, as you saw in the video, gave an amazing stirring prayer on two hours notice, essentially. So it's, it was just stark uh, to see that. So um, thank you for, again, to everybody uh, for joining today. I'm gonna, um, as Jane mentioned, I'm gonna do a presentation here. I'm gonna do, um, uh, go into my screen share, a brief history of uh, prayers in Congress. Jane mentioned the very beginning uh, that uh, first thing Congress did essentially was open with a prayer and uh, bring aboard a chaplain. They hired a chaplain, sat in the house, uh, in 1789, you see here in the timeline, uh, the, uh, they elected their chaplain uh, before the arena was uh, the Bill of Rights. Um, it was the very first thing Congress did was pray and uh, have um, and bring a chaplain on board. Guest, cha uh, guest chaplain. So the House and the Senate both have official chaplains um, uh, appointed by uh, either chamber. They are government positions um, paid for by taxpayers. Now they have staff. Uh, that tradition, again, began at the very beginning. Congress started putting together a guest chaplains and including guest chaplains um, in uh, the daily invocations opening prayer in the 1850s. The first rabbi guest chaplain, that's where our story begins. The first rabbi who was a guest chaplain uh, was in 1860. And you'll see in this next slide, uh, Sam, that the first rabbi guest chaplain, his name was Morris Raphael. Morris Raphael, uh, born in Sweden, uh, from New York City. Uh, his uh, congregation uh, was Temple Jeshurun, um, Congregation B'nai Jeshurun in uh, New York City. He gave a prayer in February 1860, and uh, the, uh, James Buchanan was president. And you can imagine the history looming over, you know, uh, a lot of, as we go through this and we'll tell the stories of rabbis who have prayed in Congress, so much of this is wrapped up in the, the history the surrounding history in the chambers. We saw Chaplain Black at the very beginning, the history of uh, January 6th. Uh, Morris Raphael gave his prayer on the eve of the Civil War, and his prayer uh, was full of foreboding, of uh, predicting of uh, you know where the country is it, uh, was. And he, talk, he quotes in here, uh, brethren uh, to live together in unity, quoting from the psalmist. Uh, this was a shock. The first rabbi guest chaplain uh, in Congress, he shows up. Uh, the New York Times didn't know what to make of him. They called, they said he dressed in his canonicals uh, in their language. Other members of Congress uh, kind of gawked and said, look at the, you know, the gentleman in costume. Uh, but he was the first uh, Jewish prayer as a guest chaplain in Congress. Uh, let's go, I want to show a video of the first, of a more current uh, rabbi guest chaplain. Um, a quick plug for I work at C-SPAN. I'm the communications director of C-SPAN. We began coverage of the House in 1979. Uh, how many uh, rabbis have prayed in Congress? Uh, 634 times a rabbi has opened Congress in prayer uh, between 1860 and October 2020. Uh, that's uh, over 441 rabbis from over 400 synagogues uh, have opened uh, uh, prayer, have opened Congress in prayer. Now, why the difference in the numbers? Um, uh, multiple rabbis have given prayers, uh, uh, about 100 rabbis have given prayers multiple times. Uh, about 100 or so rabbis have given two or more prayers. So we have 441 rabbis leading up to the number of 634 times a rabbi has opened Congress prayers from about 400 synagogues. So again, first one, 1860, that goes all the way up uh, to the present. Uh, the top synagogues of uh, rabbis who have prayed, uh, uh, a Washington Hebrew congregation, Washington Hebrew congregation, uh, 24 times a rabbi from Washington Hebrew has opened now. Sure, it's easy. Uh, geographically, uh, they are located close to the Capitol. Uh, but a couple of interesting things. Every senior rabbi from Washington Hebrew Congregation has, uh, has prayed in Congress. Uh, going back to 18, the 1870s. Uh, Why well, I have to mention Washington Hebrew Congregation is a partner uh, in my present in uh, my book. Uh, and uh, because of their support, the book that I wrote about this um, was able to progress uh, through their support. Uh, the, number, uh, the second uh, uh, largest number of rabbis from the synagogue, B'nai Jeshurun in New York City. Again, uh, the second, um, the first rabbi who prayed was B'nai Jeshurun. And the third uh, congregation, maybe you've heard of Addis Israel in Washington, D.C. as well. Very 
political synagogue, not, uh, not for being partisan, but a lot of uh, political figures belong to Addis Israel. Uh, the rabbi who uh, gave the uh, prayer uh, for the, uh, uh, the memorial service for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, she um, uh, belongs to Addis Israel. Well, I, I picked out here the congressional record. Uh, one of my favorite prayers that came across in my research here, this is from June 5th, 1944. And you can see that from this prayer, this is in the congressional record. This is the eve of uh, D-Day. And even though D-Day was supposed to be secret, you kind of get the feeling you know, that the word was out somewhat, what was about to happen the next day. And in uh, this prayer from Rabbi Solomon Metz of Addis Israel, he talks about, uh, it's very, um, you know, may the prophets of that book be inspiration of building the world tomorrow, the deathless world of Micah. You see some language here, uh, righteous and abiding peace. But on top it says, be thou with our armed forces on land, on sea, and in the air. So, you know, one of the beauties of, of the joys of doing the research in this book is the ability just to kind of reach in and look at the history uh, that attaches uh, to these prayers. So again, even though I'm talking about the rabbis praying, this is history that's applicable uh, for any denomination. Uh, most prayers by a rabbi guest chaplain, uh, a lot of people like the numbers. Uh, the, uh, the most has given, been given by uh, Rabbi Arnold Resnikoff, uh, 17. Rabbi Resnikoff is a very interesting uh, part of the story. Uh, he's given eight in the, in the Senate, nine in the House. Um, he is uh, a military chaplain. Uh, he retired from the Navy. Uh, he fought in Vietnam, and he was in the front lines of the uh, Mekong Delta. He also uh, was in Beirut in 1983 for the bombing of the uh, Marine barracks there. He gave the invocation in 1982 at the uh, Vietnam Veterans War, War Memorial. Uh, and uh, he has prayed the most number of times by any rabbi in Congress, 17. In fact, he actually has given, believe it or not, the most recent prayer uh, in Congress in, uh, by a rabbi in October 2020. Uh, there weren't that many guest chaplains overall uh, last year because of COVID and the, the safety. Uh, there were only four rabbis who gave prayers um, uh, in, uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, rabbi Resnikoff was the most recent one. So he's uh, holding the top the list of 17. Number two is Rabbi Moshe Feller, uh, a Lubavitcher rabbi who gave has given eight prayers in the Senate and one in the House. Number seven is Rabbi Arthur Schneier, uh, seven prayers. And I'm going to mention him, uh, mention another aspect of this in a second. Rabbi Arthur Schneier is a Holocaust survivor. And uh, I'm going to mention more about the role of the Holocaust uh, surviving rabbis who have prayed. Uh, just, just hold that thought for one second. The seventh, uh, the fourth place is Rabbi Joshua Haberman of Washington Hebrew Congregation, who has given seven prayers uh, in the house, uh, uh, in Congress, six in the Senate and one in the House. Uh, broken down by, I like this chart a lot, uh, broken down by denominations for Jews who are in the audience here. And I, again, not all of you are, are Jews, but it breaks down roughly a third, a third, a third equal parts, 35% um, Orthodox uh, rabbis, 34% reform and 30% conservative. This is an important stat in the Jewish community, but also much broader than that, because it shows that, and this is an important point, that, that when guest chaplains come into Congress, they are not told what denomination, they're not told, at least in the Jewish tradition, this rabbi has to be an orthodox, this rabbi has to be reform, this rabbi has to be conservative. If this, hap this number happens organically, the fact that it's roughly equal parts it's kind of a tribute um, that there are no state imposed uh, quotas for who uh, can be a guest chaplain. Um, so a lot of people are interested, well, we we're talking about uh, men rabbis. Who was the first woman rabbi? Uh, the first woman rabbi was Rabbi Sally Prezand um, in October 23, 1973. The first woman guest chaplain rabbi, I should say, um, sponsored by, and her sponsor in Congress that day was Congresswoman Bella Abzug. And if you know your Congress history and fellow lovers of Congress, we remember Bella Abzug, not just for her hats, but her, for her leading uh, part in uh, the uh, women's liberation movement uh, in the 70s. Well, she's Bella Abzug sponsored fellow New Yorker, uh, the first uh, woman rabbi, 1873. Uh, it's funny, uh, Rabbi Sally Prezan Sally in her remarks does not mention um, the fact that she, her landmark, she was the first woman, but Bella Abzug uh, did uh, mention in her remarks, her sponsoring remarks. 
One uh, interesting um, uh, footnote to this, you'll see that the congressional record in their putting of her prayer in the congressional record got her name wrong. They misspelled her last name. Uh, the correct spelling is P-R-I-E-S-A-N-D. The incorrect spelling is P-R-E-I-S-A-N-D. And that's how the congressional record had it. So this is actually one of two times that I found in my research the congressional record got the last name of the rabbis incorrect. Uh, makes finding these prayers a little tougher, but uh, we are not deterred nonetheless. Uh, how many uh, rabbis, uh, female rabbis have there been in Congress? Uh, 15 prayers uh, by 14 women rabbis. Um, at the bottom is the most recent one, Rabbi Hannah Spiro of Hill Havara has given uh, the prayer twice, actually, has uh, opened the House representatives twice in prayer. Uh, so 15 uh, prayers by 14 women. Again, the first woman rabbi is 1973. So I, I'm sure a lot of you are doing your math in your head really fast. Well, isn't that a small number? It is when you compare it to the overall uh, 400, uh, over 400 total rabbis who have prayed, or mostly men. Um, so, you know, it just is the perspective. Uh, the, uh, you know, should there be more? It depends on how you look at the numbers. Of course, uh, hopefully there will be that we can talk about. Uh, I was going to play this against the end, my apologies, um, uh, but I can talk about this one. It's a lot of fun. Um, uh, Rabbi Dina Feingold of a Beth Hillel temple in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, gave the Senate opening uh, prayer in the Senate um, in April, 1994. And uh, if you recognize the last name, you are correct. Uh, who was the Senator from Wisconsin? Uh, Senator Russ Feingold. And Russ Feingold uh, was, uh, was presiding over the Senate that day and introduced uh, his sister. Uh, uh, and uh, he, uh, she gave the prayer uh, in April, 1994. Uh, I love talking about this. Uh, this is a subset of rabbis who have prayed uh, in Congress, um, military rabbis, military chaplains. Uh, about 55 uh, chaplains, uh, military chaplains who are rabbis have gone on to pray in Congress. And you see a couple of them here. I picked out these um, uh, for uh, rabbis because they were, in addition to being military chaplains, they wore the uniforms. Uh, Stephen Ryan of, uh, is actually of the congregation of Gudas Hachim here in Alexandria, Virginia from the Air Force. Uh, there's a Colonel Leedwald, Kenneth Leedwand of, uh, of uh, the Army, uh, Commander Morris Caprow of uh, the Navy, and Harold Robinson of the Navy as well. So these are four of the um, uh, rabbis who have prayed in Congress from the military wore their uh, uniforms. Uh, there are many uh, uh, military chaplain rabbis uh, came out of the uh, World War II. And uh, we saw just a, a lot of the 55 rabbis who were military who prayed in Congress come out of that era. One of the great stories of, of America is obviously immigration um, and the influx from all different countries. Uh, Pol uh, immigrants from Poland, 26 prayers are delivered by, delivered by 19 rabbis uh, who emigrated from Poland. Uh, 24 prayers delivered by 16 rabbis who immigrated from uh, Germany. I love talking about this. This show; these are essentially rabbis who uh, uh, fled Europe before the Holocaust or survived the Holocaust and came to America, came here, uh, came to America, became rabbis, and then ended up praying in Congress. Ended up praying the literal heart of democracy. Um, so this shows just the diversity. Roughly about. 20, I think the number is about 22 or 23 countries other than America uh, have been represented um, uh, from rabbis who have prayed in Congress, showing just the wide uh, breadth of uh, immigration, more current uh, immigrant rabbis uh, from Latin America, uh, Cuba, uh, Mexico born rabbis have come to America uh, and have prayed in Congress. Uh, I mentioned earlier the Holocaust. Uh, I want to talk about this for just a moment here. Um, this sort of, an incredible part of the story is again rabbis who have moved to moved to America. I'm sorry, emigrated to America, either before the Holocaust or survived, came to America, became rabbis, and then prayed in the uh, the literal um, center of democracy. And here are examples of a couple of them. Um, Rabbi Isaac Newman of Iowa. Uh, prayed in Congress um, twice, and you see his prayer. 
Uh, at the bottom right is a picture of Rabbi Laszlo Berkowitz of uh, Temple Road of Shalom in, in uh, Falls Church. And just a quick note, uh, Rabbi Berkowitz was my rabbi. Um, I belong to Temple Road of Shalom in uh, Falls Church, uh, Virginia. And he actually died a few weeks ago. Um, rabbi Berkowitz uh, was one of um, six rabbis. Here's where it gets really interesting. Six rabbis who survived Auschwitz uh, and uh, ended up praying in Congress. And in fact, uh, Rabbi Berkowitz, uh, his prayer was June 14th, 1988, Flag Day. And he mentioned his love of America, love of the flag. He was sponsored that day uh, by um, uh, Congressman uh, Frank Wolf. And Frank Wolf, uh, former Congressman from Virginia, mentioned uh, uh, his rescue from Auschwitz by the 82nd Airborne. So just really amazing history comes out of, out of this. And here, just a couple more examples from the congressional record of, uh, of rabbis who survived the Holocaust and prayed in Congress. So let's get a little bit, talk a little bit about the content here. Uh, yes, the, uh, uh, when the rabbis pray, and, and again, talking about all cler uh, clergy members, uh, they have, as guest chaplains, they are given a couple rules. Um, the length of the prayer should not exceed 150 words has to be given in English, uh, submitted at least one week ahead of time for, for the congressional record. Uh, make it universal. Uh, you know, this is not, when they're praying, it's not a, um, you know, uh, everybody should be inspired and be able to listen uh, to the prayer without his or her uh, own religious beliefs being offended. And no politics. Um, you know, they, they're not there to lobby for, uh, for legislation. They're not casting votes, obviously. They're not talking politics. Uh, but they're addressing uh, their remarks to the outside world and essentially uh, to God. Talking about rabbis, what they've prayed about in their prayers, it's, uh, it's run the gamut. They've talked about war and peace, including the Holocaust, diversity, freedom and values, the environment, American history, space. A lot of, uh, again, connecting uh, their prayers to the space program or just connecting their prayers to history. Uh, rabbis who have, have prayed uh, when the space shuttle has gone up and they've mentioned uh, uh, the space shuttle in their prayers. Uh, rabbis have prayed um, uh, during the Mercury program, the very beginning of the space program, mentioned prayers for those astronauts as well. Uh, and of course, at the bottom, American institutions, Congress and government, uh, the Liberty Bell has been mentioned uh, multiple times, the Constitution, great American figures, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, uh, they have all been cited um, in rabbi prayers uh, in Congress. This is, uh, I like telling this to Jewish audiences, the big winner. So who gets mentioned the most of Jewish figures? Isaiah. Isaiah is cited in 70 rabbi prayers. And since this is a non-Jewish audience, I'll mention that he has been cited in many non-Jewish uh, uh, prayers as well, particularly for Isaiah 2.4. If anyone in the audience knows their scripture, uh, knows that uh, that's the, the line, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn more anymore. Very universal message cited many times by rabbis, but also cited repeatedly um, by the, um, by the, the, the official chaplains and non-rabbi uh, guest chaplains as well. And I, I will mention here, even though it's not on the slide, that um, uh, to take this to a non-Jewish level, um, uh, guest, uh, I'm sorry, chaplain, uh, Senate Chaplain Barry Black has cited Micah uh, many times. Uh, I think it's Micah 2.4 about uh, every man shall live to nurse the fig tree and none shall make them afraid, uh, which is also George Washington's favorite uh, passage. And if you watch Hamilton, you know that Hamilton mentioned George Washington and Micah and sitting under your vine and fig tree and none shall make them afraid. Well, that also has gotten a lot of play in, uh, in prayers in Congress overall. Uh, one thing I love, I love this uh, uh, Hebrew. Hebrew shows up in, in the congressional record. It's when I first did my research, when I first came upon this, it was an amazing sight just to see uh, uh, Hebrew lettering in the congressional record, but it has happened. Uh, and here are examples of it. For some reason, I can't really answer. It happened a lot in the 60s. Uh, again, you can't, some, I think the rules have changed that you can't speak foreign language anymore. So the amount of Hebrew being spoken in prayers have dwindled. Uh, but here are just four examples of uh, Hebrew spoken by rabbis in, uh, in the 60s and the, and, and the Hebrew uh, lit letters show up in, uh, uh, in the congressional record the next day. Um, again, Sam, my apologies. I was going to show a video of uh, Rabbi uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs, uh, who actually died last year 
uh, for, but I, I could just talk about this, gave an amazing prayer of uh, uh, universality. Uh, he brilliant uh, philosopher in addition to being a rabbi uh, and uh, from Britain. So he was a lord, the, um, the, uh, the chief rabbi as it were of Britain for many years, died last year. Uh, but it's been a surreal, real subset of rabbis who have prayed in Congress or those who prayed from foreign lands, uh, not Americans, uh, immigrants, but actually rabbis who came to Congress uh, and then returned back home afterwards. Uh, the countries that have had rabbis who have, this is a real geeky subset here, but the rabbis who have uh, prayed in Congress from other countries, uh, uh, you see here, Lord Jonathan Sachs, uh, from Britain, I think another uh, one or two rabbis from Britain have prayed. Um, Canada has sent rabbis here. The um, cousin, and I have never mentioned this before, but I love this, the cousin of uh, former Senator Herb Cole of Wisconsin, Ruch Cole is his name. He prayed in the Senate, uh, I think about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, returned home to his congregation um, in, in Canada. And the third country, uh, this is a fun one, uh, where rabbis have prayed from a different country, Israel. Israel does not begin in the Knesset, uh, the Israeli parliament, with a prayer. Uh, no prayers in the Israeli parliament. If you want to be, if you're a rabbi and you want to pray uh, in the legislative body, you have to come to America to do that. So uh, examples of foreign uh, rabbis who prayed in Congress. Uh, rabbi Sachs was sponsored that day by Joseph Lieberman uh, in the Senate and gave very charming uh, remarks after, uh, after the prayer. Um, I can't, I can't, again, can't, my apologies not being able to play the video, but I, I, I love talking about this. I mentioned Rabbi Reznikoff uh, uh, at, at the beginning uh, for the most number of prayers. Uh, after the, you've heard of the, um, if you remember the uh, attack at the synagogue in Monse, New York at the end of uh, 2019, where I think six uh, congregants at a synagogue for Hanukkah were stabbed. Um, Rabbi Reznikoff gave a prayer a couple of days after, and he mentioned uh, that, uh, that stabbing, uh, and that prayer made news. It was, uh, CNN ran a snippet and ran a little clip of, uh, Rabbi Reznikov's prayer. And it was the first time, uh, that a rabbi guest chaplain, uh, prayer has ever made national television news. Of course, uh, every prayer can be seen uh, on C-SPAN, uh, our live coverage, gavel to gavel of the house and of the Senate. And rabbis frequently make new local news, um, when they show up in Congress. Uh, and pray, uh, but this was the first time a rabbi made national TV news for the significance of his or her remarks. And I will skip this now with a video. I, this is just for description of what this is. Again, all these videos live on a YouTube channel that I, uh, you can see them all uh, later on if you want. Um, I just have fun with this. These are sponsors of, uh, of rabbis who have uh, given prayers. When the members of the House or the Senate sponsor them, and they try to sometimes, when they try to pronounce the Hebrew of their of uh, of their synagogues, they stumble, uh, and sometimes the results are hilarious. So just a fun little video that was going to include it. So thank you all. <laughs> That's the presentation, uh, Jane and uh, and Sam. And uh, Sam, thank you for your time. Uh, I love to take questions. My apologies again to the uh, uh, lack of video. But if there's one silver lining, I see I would have run over on time anyways if I had shown all the videos. So. Well, leaves more time for, for questions right now. Well, we have a pile of questions for you, Howard. Um, and maybe starting with um, Congresswoman Elena Ross Layton is, is joining us. And she was especially honored to, that she was mentioned in your book and, and wanted to, to thank you for that. Um, and she wanted to know, is there a couple questions what member of Congress has had the most rabbis giving the opening prayer? And is there any state that has never in brought a rabbi to Congress? Okay, two brilliant questions. Um, before I answer that, I have to thank Congresswoman Ross Layton for participating. She is a neat example of a, uh, since we're talking about sponsorship here, of um, uh, members of Congress who sponsor rabbis who are not from their own districts. Uh, typically when a rabbi or, and again, broaden this out um, for any guest chaplain uh, to, uh, to be, uh, be brought in uh, to give the prayer, they're sponsored by somebody. Typically the member of Congress, the rabbi or a clergy member lives in his or her district. 
uh, uh, Congresswoman Rose Layton and Ileana, if you don't mind, um, sponsored uh, Rabbi Joey Hessel of Washington Hebrew Congregation, uh, uh, not far from Florida. I believe her parents, her family lived in Florida. So anyways, thank you, Congresswoman, for joining us. Um, what a great, I, you know what, I, I actually, I ran the numbers on who sponsored the most. I'm going to guess it was the former, if I can recall this, the former Congressman Deutsch of Florida, not the new one. Um, is, is Peter, I, I'm going to get this wrong, I think Peter Deutsch is the, uh, the predecessor from Florida, sponsored the most. Um, I can run, I'm happy to run the numbers on that. I love the question. There is some competition, some, um, it's also a very interesting subset here. Not every sponsor of a rabbi is Jewish, uh, as Rose, Congresswoman Rose Lightning shows. Many sponsors are not Jewish, again, with prominent members. Uh, your second question um, about uh, rabbis from, uh, has every state been represented? No, but most have, I think, 46 or 47 uh, states. Uh, I'll start with Ohio, uh, for Jean Campbell's sake. Ohio has produced a large number of, uh, from all over the state, Columbus and uh, Cincinnati, Gary Zola, who is the head of the archives, the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati has uh, prayed in Congress twice. Uh, but if, as far as obscure states, states you wouldn't associate with uh, rabbis, produ uh, states producing rabbis, Alaska. Alaska has had a guest chaplain uh, rabbi a couple years ago in the Senate, sponsored by Lisa Murkowski. Um, uh, the Dakotas haven't. Uh, Nebraska has. So yeah, a couple of this, the lower uh, states in terms of Jewish population have maybe one or two. For the most part, predominantly New York, Pennsylvania, the DC area, Florida, obviously have had the most. And, you know, a couple things, our, our audience is very engaged. So we just want to share with you, they, they, they offer a few little uh, nuggets, um, thinking that the audience would, would be protect, interested in the fact that guest chaplains have also represented the Hindu, the Muslim, the Buddhist, the Native American tradition, and that indeed the Dalai Lama has prayed uh, uh, over Congress. And so while we're you know, grateful to have your particular area of expertise and uh, it, it, we have broadened our understanding of faith to be beyond just you know, Jewish, Jewish Christian uh, faith. So Jane, can I, I, I'm so happy you mentioned that's, that's such a critical point. Two quick things. The, the guest chaplain program, the reason they have guest chaplains is not just um, procedural because the official chaplain isn't there for he or she is out of town. It's to show the diversity of religion, of faith in America. It's to demonstrate all the many religions that make up America. So yes, uh, that's the strength of the per of guest chaplains. It's the strength of America, frankly. There's so many uh, religions represented, it's represented. So yes, many faiths have been represented. The research I did, because I'm Jewish, have been rabbis, but yeah, you can totally uh, apply this kind of uh, construct to uh, many different faiths as well. Um, a question, when you talked about the very first rabbi who prayed uh, right before the Civil War, how many Jewish uh, House and Senate members were there at that time when the rabbi prayed? Oh, you're going to, uh, I don't know. I'm going to flat out say, I don't know. I know the first um, Jewish senators, I believe around that time, there was a Yuli Benjamin, um, if I have the name right, from the, I think, in fact, the first two, or two Jewish senators about that time were from the South. Um, I don't know. I'm going to punt. I'm going to. Well, let me tell you this. I know our audience. Somebody is going to Google this and we will get the answer uh, in the next 10 minutes. I have confidence in my people. Um, and two people asked um, when you talked about the reform and the conservative and the orthodox uh, Jewish traditions being represented, has there ever been a reconstructionist rabbi? Right. Wow. Uh, you have talked about a super engaged audience, Jane. Um, yes. I told you. <laughs> have been. Um, Quickly, Rabbi Hannah Spiro, who I showed in one of the slides, um, has given the most recent prayer and has in fact given two prayers to the most recent woman. She's a reconstructionist. Um, it's been small. Uh, I'm going to say maybe like uh, five or six. <laughs> this is real geeky here, but one of the, okay, I'm going to get the real subset here, but you're the audience that loves this. Uh, Rabbi Ellen Barnhart of the Albert Einstein Academy in Delaware 
was a Senate guest, guest chaplain uh, about 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, woman rabbi, reconstructionist, and sponsored by then Senator Joseph Biden. So one of the few, the only reconstruct, uh, one of the few reconstructions and female rabbis sponsored by Joe Biden uh, about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, about 15 oh, years ago. Interesting. Um, and Congressman Ross Layton, uh, it asked, we returned to the question, which you sort of talked about a little bit when you talked about the um, guidance that is given to uh, guest chaplains about what it is they are to do, that it must be in English. Um, but then some of the reference was there was some time when it was in Hebrew. And so she wanted to know, did a rabbi ever give a prayer completely in Hebrew before that current guidance was put into place? I love the question. The answer is no, and I could say this more authoritatively because as part of my research, I've gone through every prayer we're given in Congress. Um, so um, I've never, that's wonderful. I would have noticed that if it happened. Um, many prayers have had a lot of Hebrew in them, uh, but never exclusively in Hebrew. That would, that would have been quite something, but no, I don't, uh, nothing of the sort, no. Thank you for the question, though. No. And, you know, one of our listeners wanted to understand a little bit better. You talked about the guidance of, 150 words and not to be uh, political, not to be confrontational. Um, the question is, is are they given any specific restrictions on what they can't say? And if they, they submit their prayer a week in advance, do they then get feedback that say, uh, no, Howard, you can't say this, this, and this? How does that work? So I love this because <laughs> I, I'm going to I'm going to share with the with with your audience. I've learned along the way by talking personally to rabbis and giving prayers that it does happen. That they have told me that they're not edited, but they've been given feedback uh, on what they uh, what they are saying, and it's not a not a bad thing, but kind of guidance. I've had rabbis who've told me that you know it got sent back for re revisions, uh, as it were. Um, again, not, in not an adversarial way, but kind of just as a gentle guiding kind of way. So yeah, it's interesting that the no Hebrew thing, there's some, um, you know, uh, or even the length, uh, a lot of guest chaplains will have, uh, exceed the length. Um, so there, you know, there is some fudging among, and not just rabbis, but you know, the guest chaplains are all, a, lot, a little bit fudging among the rules, but those are, you know, the general guidelines. Are there any guidelines with regard to what the rabbis can wear? Uh, the, the, I love these questions. So there are no guidelines what they can wear. Part of my research, uh, I um, counted up how many rabbis wore yarmulkes uh, during their prayer. It's about 80% of the rabbis wore yarmulkes. Um, I, I know that because I'm able to see the video because uh, C-SPAN shows uh, the uh, full video of the Congress and the House, uh, the Senate and the House. So I, I don't know before 1979 when Congress TV began, uh, there's no way of knowing that. Now, here's a little fun one for you. Uh, there was a rabbi a few years ago, Rabbi Mark Getman of, uh, of New York who gave a prayer. Uh, and it was the only rabbi that I've seen visual record of who wore a talus, which is the prayer shawl the rabbis wear, um, the word of the prayer. And Rabbi Mark Getman was the only one I, I spotted wearing a talus. He has a special asterisk in his research. Uh, he's also the rabbi who has played a rabbi in the marvelous Mrs. Maisel uh, on Amazon Prime. So if you watch four or five episodes, you see a rabbi, that's Rabbi Mark Getman, who's also created in Congress. So he is the first rabbi to appear both on C-SPAN and on Amazon Prime. Well, there you go. Yeah. And see, I told you our audience would get the re research for you. The first Jewish member of Congress, uh, Judah Philip Benjamin, was a senator from Louisiana from 1853 until 1861. So now we are smarter than we were when the day started. Uh, the other question, um, are there different standards for the House or the Senate prayers? The, the standards that you, you know, shared, that list was a House, a house standard. Are there different ones for the Senate? I, I think they're roughly the same. So it's, there might be a, a tinker or two here or there, but it's roughly the same kind of standards. Well, I will say it's been actually, it's been a while since there's been a guest chapel in the Senate. Um, I can't even remember the last time. It's been three years going since the last rabbi has been in the Senate. Rabbi Seth Frisch from 
Philadelphia was the most recent one, um, but there has been, uh, they don't do as many guest chaplains for some reason on the Senate as they do in the House. And, uh, you know, our, I told you we had somebody whose dad was one of the one of the guys who prayed. And so he has two questions. Uh, he wants to know, are there foreign country parliaments that open with a prayer and have rabbis participated in those prayers in those foreign lands? And do you ever think there's going to be one day a Jewish chaplain of the House or the Senate as the official chaplain? OK, I want to answer the first one fast. Then I'm going to have fun with the second one. The first one fast. I don't know. Um, this this took me seven years to write this book. Uh, when I started doing rabbis in Indonesia, uh, I'll have far too much time on my hands. So uh, that was um, Rabbi Block's son again. Thank you for that. I, I, that's a great question. I will just go back to what I said. You can't do this in Israel. Uh, so rabbis who want to pray in, in a legislative body have to come to America to do that. Um, so as far as the official chaplains, flat out answer is no. Uh, there, uh, there are only uh, two or three Catholic uh, official chaplains. So, you know, there definitely have never been any Jewish official chaplains of the House or the Senate. Now, that being said, I know this just anecdotally from talking to rabbis. Boy, a couple of them would love to be the first. Um, everybody wants to be the first. And, you know, I do. I've had rabbis who come to me who I've met. I have the fortune of meeting this project asking not only how do I become a guest chaplain, but how do I become the official chaplain? And I'm just the guy who does the research. I'm not the guy who, uh, who uh, makes these appointments or, or picks them. So, uh, so the answer is no, but, but I'm sure, you know, it's like one of these things, one of these barrier ceiling kind of things, one day the, that should be broken. And, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. So um, one of the, and Congresswoman Ross Layton, she is your best fan, I want you to know. She says, you have to make sure to tell people that they can purchase your book and how can they purchase your book. So this is your moment for a commercial and then I get a commercial for the society about what's next. So that's very kind. Um, uh, I will do my first, I do, before I do my commercial for myself, I'll do it for you, Jane. Uh, the, the, what you all are doing has, has been enormous and so important. Uh, you, you, the, rest, the physical restoration of the Capitol after January 6th, today's session, the spiritual restoration uh, so I really can't thank you enough for giving me the opportunity, but even broader than that, uh, for talking about this. Um, thank you again to Sam for having for bailing me out uh, at the end. It was a blessing, more time to talk and answer questions. But thank you for that. Um, this is, uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for the ability to plug. I'm really bad at this. Uh, I will tell you this. It's my book, but it's not my story. It's the story of the over 400 rabbis who prayed in Congress and the members of Congress who have sponsored them. Uh, so, you know, it's, if you love Congress history, if you love the American uh, Jewish experience history, this book is for you. The publisher, Academic Studies Press, academic publisher, thankfully uh, signed on and allowed me to publish it through them. The quick answer is Amazon, like everything else. But, and here's the big but, uh, we are big fans of independent bookstores um, and independent publishers. So politics and prose sells it, you go online. I go on, um, you go through my publisher, Academic Studies Press, the publisher. The website is whenrabbisblesscongress.com. has a link to all the independent publishers you could buy there. Uh, so Amazon, if you want to go big, independent publishers, you want to help out uh, other folks. And believe it or not, it is sold at Target and Walmart. Uh, both are selling this online, uh, the book. So, you know, if you buy the book at Target, uh, and you don't like it, uh, you can return and get a lot of toilet paper in return. Uh, so <laughs> Well, Howard, you're great. You know, and we might point out when we raise the question about will there be a first Jew Jewish chaplain that uh, Chaplain Barry Black is the first black chaplain. Uh, chaplain Kibben is the first woman chaplain. So already right now we're experiencing two firsts uh, as we move forward. Um, and so we are so grateful for you spending your time and talent with us. Um, I want all of our listeners to know that this is being recorded um, and it will be available on our website. All of those persons who have joined as participants and all those who registered and couldn't end up coming um, will get a notice as soon as the raw video is available, which will be very soon. And then we have a volunteer editor that edits the dead space out. And so then it's on our YouTube and it's a little easier to work with than YouTube, but it will be available uh, right away. And this is a week 
where there are a lot of programs. And the reason that there are so many programs is because this is a moment where the eyes of the nation are on the Capitol. Uh, the Capitol is, is our citadel dem of democracy. And when we saw the Capitol attacked on January 6th, we got so many calls and so many people saying, where do we go from here? And tomorrow at noon, we're having a conversation. Where do we go from here? Um, with Yale historian Joanne Freeman, who is the author of Fields of Blood, Violence in Congress in the run-up to the Civil War, uh, Dr. Andra Gillespie, who is a political scientist uh, from Emory University, who has done a special focus on emerging African-American uh, political leaders and how they have been different over time. And Secretary Chuck Hagel, who served two terms in the Senate, uh, elected as a Republican, um, and then served in a Democratic administration as a Secretary of Defense. And he has a real passion for the Capitol, for democracy, um, and how it all plays out with the Capitol as a, our symbol in the world. That is again tomorrow at noon. You're all invited. And we have been doing a six-month series, which we call our More Perfect Union series, which is understanding the continuing struggle that we have gone on uh, in this country to try to reach the values that were set forth by our founding fathers. Yes, they were fathers. They were all men. They were all white. Some of them owned people and thought that was okay, but they still put forth documents that called for equality and justice. And the whole work of our country has been to strive for that more perfect union and voting rights has been one of the absolute bellwether uh, activities. And we have two distinguished scholars on Thursday, uh, Hassan Jeffries, who is a historian from Ohio State University, um, who will talk about the history of the voting rights struggle, and the Reverend Dr. J. Augustine, um, who is both a lawyer and a doctor of divinity, talking about some of the current issues in working toward establishing voting rights. And we have a bonus on Friday night with American University. Uh, one of our favorite board members, Jim Thurber, um, who's a distinguished professor. American University is doing uh, Dialogues in Democracy. And the first, uh, first guest is gonna be Senator Cory Booker. And we are all invited to listen to that conversation. So I hope you'll join us for some of the activities this week and next week we'll be back at it again. And remember that all of these are only available because of the members of the society, your sport and your donations make this all possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. Thank you all for being here. Invite your friends and neighbors to join us for the remainder of the week. Be well, goodbye.